I want to uh, thank Stand Up Republic Foundation and Freedom House for your kind invitation uh, here tonight. I don't have to give my background now because Mindy did such a wonderful job. And it is true, I am one of 10 kids. And I'll tell you a very brief personal story. You know, my mother was an only child and all she wanted to do was have kids. And she was very good at it. Um, my, my father had something to do with it, but she was wonderful. And she had four boys in a row and she said, oh, all I want to do is have a girl, can we try, can we try? And my father said, okay. And uh, six girls later, they rounded out the family of 10 kids. I was number seven, the third girl, the seventh child, and my mother went to her doctor and said, doctor, obviously Larry and I are thrilled. Every baby is a blessing, but I'm exhausted. Do you have any good news for me? And he said, well, actually I do. The seventh, the 14th, and the 21st child are free. They never got a bill for me, ever. And when I was in my uh, teen years as a rambunctious teenager, they used to remind me that I was worth every penny they paid for me. So um, I bring that very necessary sense of humor here to Washington, because if you don't have a sense of humor here, you are not going to survive. Uh, now, I am just entering my third term in Congress. And as Mindy said, I'm on the Homeland Security Committee and on Veterans Affairs. Um, I did try to get on another committee, but I knew that there was really no chance that that was ever going to happen on judiciary. But I have to say I am very happy um, on the committees that I serve. We have one of the largest veterans population on Long Island, as well as one of the best VAs in Northport, which is a little further out east um, from my district. But both committees play a central role in the lives of millions of Americans. Now, I just want to tell you a little bit about you know, what we're doing on the VA committee. We work very hard every day to improve the health care system that our veterans and their families depend on. That includes making sure uh, that VA hospitals have the funding and the resources they need, that veterans receive the uh, support to address everything from PTSD to addiction to physical therapy, and that our federal government is meeting the needs of our veterans in a very timely and efficient manner. Now, one of the things, we had a hearing today, and we had the secretary um, testify in front of us, and I asked him what his position was in terms of changing the motto of the VA. And I'm not going to be able to give it to you verbatim, but it was taken from a line from uh, Abraham Lincoln's second inaugural address, where he talks about the sacrifices he makes and blah, blah, blah. I didn't mean to say that, blah, 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 about anything that Abraham Lincoln said, but... <laughs> Um, I said to the secretary, you know, you have two million women who have worn the uniform of this great country, and Senator Gillibrand and I are carrying bills that would change the motto to give respect to all of those women who have worn the uniform. And uh, I mean, his response was, and he was perfectly respectful full and nice, but he said something about, you know, not wanting to dishonor Abraham Lincoln by changing his words, and I said, but everything that Abraham Lincoln stands for is about equality. And if he were alive today, he would say, of course we're gonna change that, because women, this is clearly bringing the VA into the modern world, and again, uh, this is not a question of political correctness, it is out of respect to the two million women who have um, fought for this great country of ours. Uh, so thank you for that. Now, Homeland Security, uh, we are focused on strengthening our nation's national security infrastructure from our border to our airports to public mass transit systems and increasingly um, to our cyberspace. It's been a real privilege serving on these committees and I can't tell you how exciting it is to, um, you know, after four long years in a minority to actually be in the majority and to set an agenda that can hopefully lead to legislation that can address some of these issues that I'm sure you're talking about uh, during this conference of yours. Now, um, under this administration, we have seen Democrats and Republicans from across the ideological spectrum unite to fight for our common values. But when it comes to strengthening the state of our democracy and improving the overall effectiveness of our government, there are a few things we need to do before anything else, and these things have got to be done in a bipartisan way. We need to uh, clamp down on corruption, we need to restore the integrity of our government institutions and agencies, and we need to stand up for 
core American democratic values, both here at home and abroad. Now, as a former prosecutor, I wasn't trained to view the world through a political lens. Um, when I was prosecuting criminals, whether it was a drunk driver or a violent gang member, I didn't stop to think about what party they or the victims belonged to. I just tried to look at the facts in front of me. And, you know, I, I was recently out in Silicon Valley doing a... Um, uh, you know, stop by to all the high tech companies and, and what they're doing out there, which is just amazing stuff. And I put the question to one of the principals, do, is there such a thing as facts anymore? Right? I, I mean, I, I'm just throwing that out there. I mean, it's been a long day. I, you know, I don't want to turn this into a therapy session, but I, I just was curious. Is there anything known as facts anymore? Is there ever going to be a way to distinguish the truth from fake news. And I like to believe that there are, but you know, we have to, um, we in Congress have to, have to lead the way. And I'll tell you, I'm going to go off, I know this is being filmed, but whatever I tell you I, is clearly not within the family, but that's okay. Um, so one of my fellow members who happened to be Republican, Matt Gates, put out a tweet yesterday that I thought was so despicable. Um, as to be almost disqualifying for him to be a member of Congress. Now, I know that the general public has a very low opinion of what we do. I fully accept that, and I understand why they feel that way. But when we act like that, and when we, I don't know if anyone saw the tweet, but it was, you know, kind of trying to intimidate Michael Cohen. And so I went on the floor last night, and I walked over to him, and I sat down with him, and I said, would you take that down? When you do things like that, you diminish the integrity of this great institution that is going to last well after you and I are both gone. And I'm not going to go into the rest of it, but after the conversation, you can tell how successful I felt. I sent a letter to the Ethics Committee saying, I do believe that they should look into, um, you know, that kind of rhetoric that to me as a former prosecutor, I mean, I have had people do a lot less than that and have had judges hold them in contempt and accuse them of trying to intimidate a witness. And that is just not what this Congress stands for, regardless of what's going on. Um, so let's just look at what we have over the past two years alone. We've had more than a handful of cabinet members, presidential appointees, high-ranking White House staff resign over a wide range of ethics violations, conflicts of interest, criminal acts. And then there's another handful who haven't resigned, despite being the subject of serious ethics violations themselves. Now, while this administration continues to defy all ethical norms, the president and his allies have also made a very dangerous habit of attacking the federal law enforcement community, in particular the FBI and my former workplace, the Department of Justice, casting doubt on the findings of our intelligence community and attacking our free press, a pillar of our democracy. I mean, when you start, I mean, does this, is this bringing you back to historical references of times gone past that we thought that we have overcome certainly here in this country? And unfortunately, we're, we're there again. Worst of all, in my opinion, is the pervasive corruption within this administration and its fundamental disregard for the rule of law, which I believe has eroded the trust that Americans have a right to place in their government. And it's, to say the least, and I know Chris Coons touched on this, it has badly damaged our credibility with our allies abroad. And if that wasn't enough, our president continues to insult and impugn those allies countries that have long stood besides the United States as a bulwark against tyranny and totalitarianism, and has instead propped up hostile and authoritarian regimes like North Korea and Russia. Um, the president has done this even as those same hostile regimes seek to undermine our own democracy and values, as Russia has done through inter in election interference. Um, I, I mean, there's no other more blunt way to put it than to say that our president is retreating from many fundamental American values and principles that have defined our country for nearly 250 years. Now, all of this is to say that our government, particularly at the federal level, is in dire need of accountability. Accountability that will help restore trust with our citizens and allow our allies to put their faith 
in us once again. And that's where I believe the Congress comes in. For me and for many of my colleagues in Congress, the 2018 midterm election that gave Democrats a majority, in, this, in my opinion, it was not about impeachment. It wasn't about resistance. It wasn't about partisan one-upmanship. It was about accountability and restoring integrity. After two years of no oversight whatsoever, that is how I choose to look at the results of the 2018 election. Now, don't get me wrong, there are certain priorities that our new Democratic majority must tackle. We have to address immigration reform. We have to address climate change, health care, gun violence, issues that do not need to be taken up along partisan lines, but too often are. But we can't accomplish any of that when our government isn't functioning properly, when corruption is rampant, when trust has been decimated, and when we have lost support from the international community. Now, my hope is that this Congress will help us correct the course, and not through partisan rhetoric, threats of impeachment, or political grandstanding, but through the hard work of legislating. And yes, part of that includes conducting oversight investigations and hearings where we ask the tough questions of the administration and hold them accountable for their decisions. That needs to happen. But a far more important aspect of this work is going to happen through um, bills that will bring about the common sense change that most Americans want and that our government requires. And we're not going to get there without bipartisan cooperation. That means Republicans and Democrats are faced with a choice. We can either retreat to the far fringes of our parties, and I'm not just talking about the Republican Party because I'm a Democrat, because we have fringes on our party as well. Um, are we going to cater to our base and score political points, or can we come together, compromise, and actually change the direction in which our country is headed? And if members of both parties aren't willing to compromise on issues of good governance and foreign policy, if we aren't willing to stand up for our country's values before those of our party, then we are all complicit in the wrongdoings and failures of this administration. There is no shortage of areas in which we are in dire need of bipartisan common ground and fast. Uh, let me talk about cybersecurity. Perfect example. It needs to be a bipartisan priority, regardless of the political rhetoric that all too often surrounds it. Now, Russia's interference in our election should have been the wake-up call that we needed to get serious about this. It, you can barely get anyone to talk about it. And what I keep saying to my Republican friends is, and I don't just say it now that we're in the majority, but I've been saying this since 2016, the shoe is gonna be on the other foot. It is inevitable that the shoe is gonna be on the other foot. What are you gonna be saying then? And when you come across and you say, well, you're a moderate member, will you be with us? I hate to say it, but I'm gonna say, where were you two years ago when we should have made this a democratic issue, meaning democracy, our democracy? the preservation of our democracy and the freedoms that we hold so dear. So just to give you an example, two weeks ago, we learned that the Trump administration gutted two Homeland Security Task Forces that were responsible for countering foreign interference in our elections. Now, one of the task forces focused on securing election infrastructure, while the other focused on countering foreign influence efforts, including social media disinformation campaigns. These are two critical missions that need to be fully funded and supported. Now, with the 2020 elections already underway, as crazy as that sounds, we need to be ramping up our election security efforts, not dismantling them. Just as we are certain that Russia interfered in the 2016 presidential election, we know for a fact that they were also involved in 2018, maybe not to such a great extent, only because you had individuals, and I can talk just personally about the D-trip, because we brought in experts who were able to identify all of the disinformation and had an agreement with all the social media platforms that if we could show you that this was malicious and lay the groundwork, they said they would be willing to take them down, and they did. And we did that on our own with no help from the government, but that should not be the way that it is. It should be across the board that Republicans and Democrats have access to that kind of resource so that we can ensure that we do not have foreign influence 
in our elections. They are the cornerstone of our democracy, and by undermining our election security efforts, the president is undermining the legitimacy of our government. I get it. I'm a fellow New Yorker. I knew Donald Trump before he was president. I could tell you some stories, but maybe later on. Um, <laughs> they're pretty funny, actually. He would probably laugh, too, if he were here, and I, I told him. Um, but I, uh, I get, you know, for him to say, yes, there was interference, he feels that that would be, ergo, I am an illegitimately elected president. I don't go that far. I don't go that far. Because I don't think we can make that exact connection. But it's, it should be enough to say that regardless of what the outcome, whether the outcome would have been different, we cannot allow this kind of interference to happen, regardless of who ends up winning or losing. So I led a bipartisan group of members to call for the appointment of an election security coordinator to oversee and coordinate our nation's elect election security efforts. Unfortunately, that letter went unanswered by President Trump, which only further convinced me and several of my colleagues that he is clearly not committed to this effort. And perhaps worst of all, through his incessant attacks on our law enforcement and intelligence communities, the president has used his incredibly vast platform to convince some percentage of Americans that this is all fake news, made up by Democrats because we're sore losers and we can't take losing. Now, it's critical to remember that this isn't just a domestic issue. How we respond to this threat has major implications for our foreign policy agenda, particularly as it relates to our close allies in Western Europe. Countries like France, England, Germany, they're all dealing with the exact same threat. They've all been victims of Russian hacking and misinformation campaigns. And they're looking to us, to America, for leadership and assistance. The last thing they want or expect to see is that we aren't taking this threat seriously, or worse yet, that we are cozying up to the perpetrators. Now, it, it makes me sad and ashamed that our country isn't being a good partner in this fight. We are kowtowing to a foreign adversary who is seeking to isolate us from our allies and each other when we should be leading the fight to prevent these actions in the future. Now, an even greater threat to our democracy lies right here within our country and within our politics itself, and that's the rampant corruption that has enveloped Washington in recent years. Um, look, Secretaries Ross, Mnuchin, Carson, former Secretary Zinke, Pruitt, Price, they have all, I mean, this is not a joke, this is, <laughs> this is real. They've all faced allegations of serious ethics violations. The latter three were forced to resign. And then there are the numerous federal investigations surrounding the president, his family, his business, his close associates, which we read about endlessly. And if you turned any TV on today, you heard about it endlessly. The common theme in almost all of these cases is the influence of foreign money. Because of massive loopholes in our laws, including the uh, FARA, the Foreign Agents Registration Act, American lobbying firms, law practices, political organizations, real estate companies have helped steer billions of dollars in foreign money into the US economy and political sphere. And these are, aren't just foreign investments. I mean, as we saw from Paul Manafort's trial, Russian oligarchs, the Saudi ro royal family, authoritarian, authoritarian leaders across the globe have consistently exploited our laws to funnel their fortunes into the American real estate in no place more than New York City, where New York State, where I am from, and anonymous shell companies while simultaneously buying the influence of those who are responsible for scrutinizing and regulating such actions. Think tanks, elected officials, political organizations, cabinet secretaries. Whether it's Russian oligarchs buying millions of dollars in Trump organization properties, Saudi investments in Jared Kushner's family business, or the unusually close relationship between the Russian government and the NRA, there's no question that foreign investments, often from authoritarian and nefarious regimes, have infiltrated our nation's economy and political arena, all while these governments work against American interests abroad. Now, to be fair, to be fair, the current administration isn't entirely to blame. This has been a growing and unregulated problem for the better part of the last two decades. But in today's Washington, these actions have found an unprecedented level of leniency and even a tacit acceptance, in large part because so many in the administration stand 
to benefit from them. This pay-to-play paradigm is a virus, and Washington has become the perfect host. I mean, this is a dire threat to our democracy, one that we can no longer afford to ignore. We need to address it immediately, and it's something that I am going to focus on in this new Congress. Now, my hope is that we can do it across party lines because the stakes are equally high for both parties, whether you're a Democrat or a Republican. We are all Americans first, and we should care about upholding our nation's guiding principles. Right now, our country is at a moment of reckoning. And if we are not okay with the status quo, if we're concerned about the state of our democracy and the direction of our country, then we need to act with a greater sense of urgency and we need to do it together. Thankfully, when it comes to protecting our democracy, strengthening our foreign policy and cleaning up corruption, there is far more that unites Democrats and Republicans than divides us. That is a fact. Look, last year, um, after one of my colleagues was in, from my home state, Chris Collins, um, was indicted for insider trading, I joined forces with a fellow Republican, Tom Reed, from New York as well, to introduce a bill that would prohibit members of Congress from serving on corporate boards. <laughs> what? When I heard that, I thought, how, how is he even able to be on a board? The Senate took care of that. The House never did. So Tom and I got together. Um, to me, it was a no-brainer. It wasn't about politics. It wasn't about trying to unseat a Republican. By the way, he got reelected overwhelmingly, okay? It was about closing a gaping loophole, fighting corruption, and restoring trust of our voters. Uh, that's something that people in both parties value deeply. Look, I have said since I've been here, I was never a believer in term limits. You know, I got into politics, but it was, I was a DA, which, you know, some can argue should be in a point of position, some elected. I think it should be elected because you should be nonpartisan. Uh, and I always behaved as a nonpartisan um, DA, but I've always said I am the kind of politician who's going to self-impose a term limit on me. And I did. I just got reelected to a third term as DA. And I say this without ego, because you don't have an ego when you grow up with 10 kids. It was hard enough to get to the dinner table when there was still food on it. Um, I probably could have been the DA for life there. I mean, we do that a lot in New York State. We have people who, once they become DA, they're there forever. But I didn't, I don't think that would have been right for the county, for the DA's office, and certainly not for me professionally. And that's why I ran. I also felt that it was important to um, stop complaining about Washington and deciding to do something about it. But if we want voters to care, if you don't want people to go to the polls and say, all right, you know, Chris Collins, I mean, I know he's under federal indictment, and boy, does that evidence look bad. I mean, he's innocent until proven guilty, but really, there's no other choice but someone who's under federal indictment? That is absurd. That is absurd. So I, I've been saying to my colleagues here, you know what, if we don't want to overhaul the, um, if we're not gonna do anything about campaign finance, which by the way, is not gonna happen, like Citizens United, too heavy a lift, it's never gonna happen. I mean, that's me being pessimistic about it. Maybe if some things change over the next two, four, or six years, we can address that issue. Let's either impose term limits on us, like say four terms for members of the House, two for members of the Senate. And by the way, if you can't get something done here in eight years or 12 years, you don't belong here anyway, is my feeling. Okay, but if you don't wanna impose term limits so you can keep this job forever, then get rid of gerrymandering, okay? and institute independent commissions, independent commissions who will draw the lines fairly and not in a way that, you know, if you looked at that seat that um, in Florida that literally snaked down the entire state of Florida and the judge was like, eh, eh, done. And by the way, when you re redraw this, when he sent it back to the state, you can only go this far east, west, and this far north, south. Now, do we want, and this is what I say to my colleagues, judges are determining what our congressional districts are. Okay, that, that's the fact, because all of these lines that are gerrymandered ridiculously are challenged in the courts, 
And the courts, and, and I don't want to hear any member of the House or the Senate say these, these courts are activist courts. No, no, no. They're doing our job because we're not. So someone's got to do it. So, by the way, you can imagine the whole term limit thing went over like a lead balloon. So I don't know how much luck I'm going to have with the independent commissions. But um, look, more and more states are doing this. More and more states are seeing the writing on the wall and they're taking matters into their own hands because if we don't do something about the pitifully poor voter turnout in this country, and I'm speaking from a state where it is as low as it can be, and it certainly was in the congressional primaries in June of last year, and we have no hope. Forget about foreign interference. If we can't get people to come and vote, there's no hope. Um, other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, how was the play? <laughs> I, I, I don't want you to think that I'm being overly pessimistic. I really do believe that there is a lot that we can accomplish. I can tell you that um, uh, I try to socialize with as many Republicans as possible. We are putting a group together of Dems and Rs who are going to stay after we're out of session to get together to try to really get down to legislative agenda that we can pass in a bipartisan way. And I'm very hopeful that we're going to be able to do that. Um, but I can tell you that there's only so much that elected officials can do. If it isn't for people, if it wasn't for people like you in this room who cared enough to come to a retreat like this, so you can talk about some of the issues that I touched on and even more broad issues. I mean, if it wasn't for SURF and Freedom House and all of you in this room, um, we'd be doomed. So I want to applaud you and, uh, and the same way that Chris did by saying, we need you. Um, there are a lot of well-meaning people in Congress, but the infrastructure such as it is, is so weighted against getting anything done. And if we don't have people in the public sphere like you who are out there fighting this fight and marching right along with us, uh, we're in trouble. So thank you for caring. Thank you for walking the walk, not just talking the talk. And I really do, uh, I am, uh, look, my mother always said, people would say, how do you raise 10 kids? She said, you just, I'm the eternal optimist. And I do have that optimism in me. But it's going to take a lot of work. And seeing how many people are here talking about the issues that matter to uh, maintaining this democracy, and I'm not, that's not hyperbole. This really is a, a, an existential threat that we face right now. So I want to thank you all so much for your involvement, for marching right along with us, and I look forward to fighting that good fight with you. Thank you very much, and enjoy the rest of your conference. <laughs>